Lesson 9 for February 24 through to March 2, ready for teaching on March 3. Offerings of Gratitude. Sabbath afternoon, February 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our lesson this week is titled Offerings of Gratitude, and we are eternally grateful to you for the salvation that you provide, for the care you provide, the oversight in our lives, and the help with our daily living. We thank you for your word, and as we open it this week, we praise you and give you glory for what it contains. May our minds and our hearts be changed, be influenced positively by what we read this week. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is a familiar verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's read that again, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our God is a giving God. This great truth is seen most powerfully in the sacrifice of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We just read again in John 3.16. Or in this verse, Luke 11.13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God gives and gives. It's his character. Thus, we who seek to reflect that character need to give as well. It's hard to imagine more of a contradiction in terms than that of a selfish Christian. One way to give back what we have been given is through offerings. Our offerings represent an opportunity to express gratitude and love. On the day that Jesus welcomes the redeemed into heaven, we will see those who have accepted his grace and realize that those acceptances were made possible by our sacrificial offerings. This week, we will look at important aspects of offerings, giving generously, whether from means, time or talent, is a powerful way of living our faith and revealing the character of the God whom we serve. Sunday, February 25. Where your treasure is. Question. Read Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through to 21. Although we are so familiar with these verses, how can we nevertheless be free from the powerful hold earthly treasures can have on us? Also have a look at Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 6, beginning at verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. From his book, published by the Pacific Press Publishing Association, Beyond Blessings, um, see... Adelina Alexei writes in the chapter Where Your Heart Belongs, and it's edited by Nikolaus Stadelmeier. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Matthew 6.21, is an appeal from Jesus. The full magnitude of this statement can be seen from the preceding two verses, which contrast storing our treasures on earth with storing them in heaven. 
Three words in Matthew 6.19 describe earth, moths, rust and thieves, all of which imply just how temporal and transient our earthly treasure is. Who hasn't learned just how quickly earthly things can vanish? On earth, everything is unstable, uncertain and insecure. It is subject to decay, destruction, stealing and loss. Heaven is the opposite. Everything is eternal, durable, secure and imperishable. In heaven, there is no loss. End of quote. Look at your possessions. Even if you have only a very few, sooner or later, most of them will be thrown away. The exception might be an heirloom, but a wise steward should be concerned with putting treasures in heaven for safekeeping. There, unlike here, you don't have to worry about recessions, thieves, or even plunderers. Matthew six nineteen to 21 contains one of the most important concepts on stewardship. Your treasure pulls, tugs, coerces, draws, demands, allures and desires to control your heart. In the material world, your heart follows your treasure. So, where your treasure is, remains vitally important. The more we focus on earthly needs and gains, the harder it is to think of heavenly matters. Professing belief in God, but keeping our treasure here on earth is hypocritical. Our actions must agree with our words. In other words, we see our treasures on earth by sight, but we must see our offerings as treasures in heaven by faith, as it says in Second Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Although we, of course, need to be practical and provide for our needs, even retirement, it's crucial always to keep the big picture, eternity, in mind. And to finish today, read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. What important point is Paul making here about the contrast between treasure on earth and treasure in heaven? Hebrews 10.34 For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Monday, February 26, Stewards of the Grace of God Question. What, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, is something else God has given us? Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is undeserved favour. It is a gift you do not deserve. God has poured out His grace on this planet, and if we would simply not reject it, His grace will reach down and transform our lives, now and for eternity. All the wealth and power of heaven is embodied in the gift of grace, as we read in Second Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. Even angels are amazed at this ultimate gift, as we read in 1 Peter 1 and verse 12. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. No question, of all that God gives us, the grace given us in Jesus Christ is the most precious gift of all. Without grace, we would be without hope. Sin's doleful impact on humanity is too great for humans even to free themselves from it. Even obedience to God's law couldn't bring life to us. Galatians 3.21 reads, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, 
For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. After all, if any law could save us, it would be God's law. But Paul says that even that can't do it. If we are to be saved, it would have to be by grace. Question. Read First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. How is stewardship related to grace? Explain how giving to God and to others displays this grace. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter said that as we have received the gift of God's grace, we are to be stewards of the manifold grace of God in return. That is, God has given us gifts. Therefore, we need to give back from what we have been given. What we have received by grace is not just for pleasing and benefiting ourselves, but for the furtherance of the gospel. Freely we have been given, which is what grace is all about. Freely, then, we need to give every way we can. And so to finish today, think about all that God has given you. In what ways can you then be a steward of the grace you have been given so freely? Tuesday, February 27, Our Best Offering Question, read Luke chapter 7, verses 37 to 47. What does this story teach us about the proper motivation for offerings to God? Luke 7, beginning at verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city, who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. And, when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven... The same loves little. Mary entered the room and saw Jesus reclining at the table. She broke the alabaster box of expensive nard and poured it on him. Some thought her act was improper, considering that the life she lived was illicit. But Mary had been set free from demon possession, as we read in Luke 8 verse 2. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Then, after witnessing the resurrection of Lazarus, she became overwhelmed with gratitude. Her perfume was the most valuable possession she owned, and it was her way of showing thankfulness to Jesus. This story captures what truly should be our motivation in the giving of our offerings, gratitude. After all, 
what other response should we have to the priceless gift of the grace of God? His generosity also prompts us to give, and, when coupled with our gratitude, both make up the ingredients of meaningful offerings, including our time, talents, treasures, and bodies. Question. Read Exodus chapter 34, verse 26, Leviticus 22, 19 to 24, and Numbers 18, 29. While the context is completely different from today, what principle can we take from these texts in regard to our offerings? First of all, Exodus 34, 26, The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Leviticus twenty two nineteen to twenty four, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfil his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind, or broken, or maimed, or have an ulcer, or eczema, or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb that has any limb too short or too long, you may offer as a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised, or crushed, or torn, or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land. And Numbers 18 verse 29. Of all your gifts you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the consecrated part of them. Our best offerings may seem insufficient in our eyes, but they are sufficient in God's. Giving God the best shows that we put Him first in our lives. We don't give offerings in order to receive favours. Instead, we give what we have out of gratitude for what we have been given in Christ Jesus. Ellen White writes in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 397. Entire devotion and benevolence, prompted by grateful love, will impart to the smallest offering the willing sacrifice, a divine fragrance, making the gift of priceless value. But, after willingly yielding to our Redeemer all that we can bestow, be it ever so valuable to us, if we view our debt of gratitude to God as it really is, all that we may have offered will seem to us very insignificant and meagre. But angels take these offerings, which to us seem poor, and present them as a fragrant offering before the throne, and they are accepted. Wednesday, February 28, The Motives of the Heart In an earlier lesson, we noted the story of the widow's generous offering. Although minuscule in comparison to other offerings, it was generous because it showed the true nature of her character and heart, prompting Jesus to say, This poor widow has put in more than all, in Luke 21, verse 3. God alone, as we read in James 4.12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Knows our true motives. Proverbs 16 verse 2 reads, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. And 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. It is possible to have the right actions with the wrong motives. To give out of abundance does not require much faith. 
but to give sacrificially for the good of others can indeed say something very powerful about our hearts. Question. Read Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8 to 15. What is Paul talking about here in regard to giving and the motives for giving? What principles can we take from these verses regarding stewardship? 2 Corinthians 8, beginning at verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, He who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Whatever your motive for giving may be, it is on a continuum that ranges from ego to altruism. The fight of this continuum between selfishness and giving is fought more frequently than any other spiritual fight. Selfishness will chill a heart that was once on fire for God. The problem comes when we let selfishness into our Christian experience. That is, we find ways to justify our selfishness and do it in the name of Christ. The bottom line comes down to one word, love, and love cannot be manifested without self-denial, a willingness to give of oneself, even sacrificially, for the good of others. Unless God's love is reflected in our lives, our giving will not reflect God's love. A selfish heart tends to love only itself. We must ask the Lord to circumcise the foreskin of our heart, as it says in Deuteronomy 10.16, so that we can learn to love as we have been loved. Love is the basis of all true beneficence, and it captures the sum of all Christian benevolence. God's love, directed toward us, inspires us to love in return, and it is truly the supreme motive for giving. And so to finish today, what's wrong, if anything, with a free will offering given more out of a sense of obligation than a sense of love? Thursday, March 1. The Experience of Giving If Christ came to reveal to us the character of God, one thing should be clear by now. God loves us, and He wants only the best for us. He asks us to do only what would be for our own benefit, never to our detriment. This would include, too, His call for us to be generous and cheerful givers of what we have been given. The free will and generous offerings we give are as much a benefit to ourselves, the giver, as they can be to those who receive them. Only those who give this way can know for themselves just how much more blessed it is to give than to receive. Question. Read Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. How does this text so encapsulate what giving should be about? Second Corinthians 9 beginning at verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Giving a generous offering can and should be a very personal spiritual act. It is a work of faith, an expression of gratitude for what we have been given in Christ. And, as with any act of faith, giving only increases faith, for faith without works is dead, it says in James 2.20. And there is no better way to increase faith than to live out our faith, which means doing things that grow out of our faith, that spring from it. As we give, freely and generously, we are reflecting in our own way the character of Christ. We are learning more about what God is like by experiencing Him in our own acts. Thus, giving like this only builds trust in God and the opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Psalm 34 verse 8. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 20, It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. End of quote. And so to finish today, in what ways have you experienced the reality of how faith grows through giving freely and generously out of what you have been given? Friday, March 2. From the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, October 17, 1882, Ellen White writes, The spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. The spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. Christ's self-sacrificing love is revealed upon the cross. He gave all that he had, and then gave himself that man might be saved. The cross of Christ appeals to the benevolence of every follower of the blessed Saviour. The principle illustrated there is to give, give. This carried out in actual benevolence and good works is the true fruit of the Christian life. The principle of worldlings is to get, get, and thus they expect to secure happiness. But carried out in all its bearings, the fruit is misery and death. And that brings us to our... One, two, three, four, five discussion questions for this week. One, what is it about selfishness that makes it so contrary to the spirit of Christ? What are conscious things that we can do to help protect ourselves from what is such a natural attitude for a fallen human being? Two, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Second Corinthians 9 verse 7. The Greek word translated as cheerful appears only once in the New Testament and is the word from which we get the English word hilarious. What should that tell us about our attitude to giving? 3. Make a list of all that you have been given in Christ. Pray about what you write down. What should this list teach us about why we should give in response to what we have been given? At the same time, what does your list teach you about how even our best gifts, given for the best motives, can seem so paltry in the face of what we have received? 4. Why is selfishness a guaranteed way to make yourself miserable? And 5. Think about someone in your own church family right now who is in some kind of need. What could you do? even right now, that could reach out and help minister to this person or persons? What can you do, even if it takes a painful sacrifice on your part?
Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Tragedy, Cocaine and Jesus, and it's by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Mervyn Jaikaran, a machinery operator at a wood factory in the Caribbean nation of Trinidad and Tobago, was unconscious for four days and hospitalised for three months after a devastating car accident at the age of seven. Jaikaran had been walking along the side of the road when the car struck him and dragged him for 50 yards or 45 metres, ripping off the side of his face and inflicting deep back injuries. Mummy says I was dead and brought back to life, says Jaikaran, now 52, whose face is badly scarred on the left side. I say, Mummy, I was dead in sin, but Jesus brought me back to life. Jaikaran, one of nine siblings, was raised by a single Seventh-day Adventist mother after his father deserted the family. At the age of 11, he quit school, unable to study because of brain damage sustained in the accident. He started smoking and drinking at 14 and eventually expanded to marijuana and cocaine. He married at 28 and became the father of four. But Jaikaran kept using drugs and his wife finally left with the children. Jaikaran said he desperately wanted to change. One day he cried out, Jesus, I want to change, but I don't want my wife's help. I don't want my mummy's help. I want your help. Hours later, he received a call from the director of the Adventist-operated Drug Rehabilitation Centre called Love Until Ready Centre. He subsequently learned that his sister had contacted an Adventist pastor for help and the pastor had called the rehab centre. Jai Karan eagerly checked himself in for treatment. He was 46 years old. Progress was slow, but he claimed biblical promises daily. His three favourites were Isaiah 26 verse 3 You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And Joshua 1 verse 5, I will not leave you nor forsake you. And Matthew 6 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. He also prayed for the Lord to bind together his family and bind the family closer to the Lord. At the end of the rehab program, Jaikaran's estranged wife came to pick him up and drive him to his mother's house, But when his wife saw he was a new man, she unexpectedly took him home. Both ended up getting baptised. These days, Jaikaran tells everyone he meets about his love for Jesus. He prays daily, Lord, give me some more so I can talk about you. I believe that the Lord brought me into this world so I can be a witness for him, he said. Nothing is about me. It is all about him. This lesson has been read by Dr. Percy Harold in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired. It is brought to you by the Sabbath School Department and through the services of Hope Channel. Remember, God is always faithful.